So this week we're looking at Ovid's Metamorphoses. I, ch I specifically chose a section that is continuous, so we won't have to jump around. Let's look at this week's questions. One, in the story of Pygmalion, his statue is not any less beautiful naked. Do you think this is unusual? Why or why not? Question two. In the story of Mira, do you think Mira should shoulder most of the blame for her incest? Why or why not? Question three. The story of Venus and Adonis says that Venus is pricked by Cupid's arrow. If the gods represent different ideas, moments, and skills in human life, what do you think it means that they are susceptible to Cupid's arrows? Uh, so the idea here is uh, when someone is poked or pricked by Cupid's arrow, they fall in love with the next person they see. But in this story, the person who is pricked by the arrow is a god. Uh, so how does that change our understanding of uh, how the Greeks understand their gods. What does it mean for a god also to be vulnerable to Cupid? Question four. Do you think the story of Atalanta answers Adonis's question? If so, how? If not, why not? Question five. Compare the story of Pygmalion with the story of Venus and Adonis. How are they similar? How are they different? OK, let's start from question one. Pygmalion. Uh, this is from book 10 out of 24 books, so somewhere near the middle. And the footnote tells us that this part of the poem is told or sung by Orpheus, the most famous musician in ancient Greece. So it begins with a quotation mark, right? He's singing the poem. Uh, so let's start from set, uh, stanza two here. He created an ivory statue. Ivory in Chinese is uh, xiangya. A work of most marvelous art. Uh, the word marvelous is very interesting because it comes from the noun marvel. A marvel is, first of all, a film company that makes superhero movies. But marvel originally meant something that is amazing. So marvelous art is something that people would look at and think, wow, that's amazing. And he gave this statue a figure or a shape better than any living woman could boast of. And promptly conceived, which means something uh, he, he something was born in him. Uh, conceived a passion for his own creation. Basically, he fell in love with his own statue. You would have thought it alive, so like a real maiden, that only its natural modesty kept it from moving. Art concealed artfulness. Pygmalion gazed in amazement, burning with love for what was in likeness a body. So what looked like a body. A human, a, a, a live human body. Now, at this moment, you might be thinking, but it's a statue. It, like we look at ancient Greek and Roman statues, and nobody is confused. Everybody knows it's a statue. What's going on? And the thing is, when we look at statues today, they're mostly white, right? Made of white stone. Here it's made out of ivory. Sometimes it's made out of marble, tarishi. But they used to be uh, covered in 
paint and color. It's only after thousands of years when we look at them now, all of the paint has fallen away. When these ancient Greek and Roman statues were first made, uh, they were covered in colorful paint. Uh, and the colors are, are not like today. If you look at a, a classical painting, it kind of looks like a human. Uh, the colors that the ancient Greeks and Romans used were very convincing, very alive. They looked exactly like the color of skin or the color of clothing. They were vibrant, bright, uh, enticing, entertaining colors. So it's unlikely, but it's not impossible uh, for someone like Pygmalion to look at a statue and think, wow, that looks like a real person. Of course, it's it's less likely when that person, Pygmalion, is the creator of the statue. And that's why this is a myth. So he falls in love with his own statue. Often he stretched forth a hand to touch his creation, attempting to settle the issue. Was it a body or was it this? He would not yet concede a mere statue. He gives it kisses and they are returned. He imagines. Now he addresses and now he caresses it. Uh, so notice the now now construction. In Chinese, this is Isha Zhang, Isha Nayang. Feeling his fingers sink into its warm, pliant flesh. Pliant means it's manipulable, it changes under your hand. And fears he will leave blue bruises all over its body. He seeks to win its affections with words and with presence pleasing to girls, such as seashells and pebbles. Uh, tame birds, armloads of flowers in thousands of different colors, lilies. Uh, I think this is by her. Bright painted balls. Uh, OK, so today we don't really care about bright painted balls, but in those days when paint was more valuable and uh, the paint itself was more colorful, uh, I bet these were more popular gifts. Curious insects in amber. First of all, curious here means strange. Uh, the, the original meaning of curious is strange. Amber in Chinese is hu po. He dresses it up. He dresses up the statue and puts diamond rings on its fingers, gives it a necklace, a lacy brassiere and pearl earrings. Uh, the word brassiere is the full word for bra, xiong zao. Uh, pearl is um, zhenzhu. And even though all such adornments or decorations truly become her, to become someone means to make them look good, like they belong on that person. She does not seem to be any less beautiful naked. So that's our first question. Is this unusual for, uh, I guess, a person? Because he's thinking about this statue as a person. Is it unusual for a person to be as beautiful naked as they are beautiful when they wear the best clothing and they have the best um, jewelry and uh, adornments on their body. Well, on the one hand, we can say that, of course, some people are beautiful when naked, uh, and it's perhaps two different kinds of beauty. Uh, the beauty of the body is more based on the shape, natural shape, whereas beauty of clothing and jewelry is based on the design and arrangement and combination 
of these artificial or man-made items. But because we're talking about Western literature, there's another aspect we should think about, which is that most of Western society today lives in a Christian tradition. Now, of course, uh, Ovid was writing, I believe before, yes, he was writing before Christianity became a really big thing. But today when we read this, uh, there, there seems to be a kind of clash between Ovid's pre-Christian tradition and how the Christian tradition views the human body today. And the Christian idea of a naked body is heavily influenced by the book of Genesis, Chuang Siji. And we'll talk about this later in the semester when we read the Bible. But the idea is that humans were born innocent, no sin, no idea of good and evil, and therefore no shame uh, about any of their actions because all of their actions were good and no shame about uh, like nakedness or their body or things like that because all of it was created by God and so all of it was good. Humans only started to, I guess, learn shame or to, to begin to develop shame when they were seduced by Satan to eat the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As you can tell from the name, uh, the fruit gives the eater knowledge of what is good and what is evil. Although here, uh, not the word knowledge is probably not the best word. It gives the eater the, an idea of good and evil. It gives the eater the idea that some things may be evil, that evil could exist in the world. And so from that uh, beginning, uh, after eating the fruit, humans developed sexual desire. And from sexual desire, there is a connection with the human body. So if sexual desire is uh, born from disobeying God, is born from sin, then the naked body and the parts of the naked body that are related to sex are also sinful and uh, shameful. So when we read this passage from the Christian tradition, the idea that someone could be as beautiful naked as they are well-dressed, as beautiful naked as they are beautiful when well-dressed, uh, is quite different from how the Christian tradition understands the naked body. So to answer the question, it would only be unusual if we think about this story from uh, the perspective of today, uh, the Western tradition that has been influenced by Christianity. But if we think about this in the perspective of ancient Rome before Christianity, when there was a much more open and uh, natural attitude to the human body, it's not unusual at all. It's just simply another way to present the human body. Okay, do you have questions about this point? If not, let's move on to question two. The story of Mira. Um, the story of Pygmalion, as you know, because of course you have already read the story before coming to class, ends uh, when he prays to Venus, the goddess of love, who in Greece was named Aphrodite, but the Romans renamed her Venus. He prays to Venus to 
uh, make his statue real. And Venus does it. She does make the statue real and the statue falls in love with him. And that's how the story ends. Um, and then before the ninth moon had come to its crescent, uh, I'm on page. The page is this. I'm on page 1054. So before the ninth moon, so within nine months, a daughter was born to them. Paphos, who gave her own name to the island. Uh, so the place where they're living is now known as, in some cases, the Romans called it Paphos, uh, and it's a place, the footnote tells us that it's a place that is sacred to Venus. She, Paphos, had a son named Cinerus, who would be regarded as one of the blessed, uh, blessed by the gods, if he had only been childless. I sing of dire events. Depart from me, daughters. Depart from me, fathers. Uh, so we know that the following story will be some terrible story that's related to uh, fathers and daughters. Um, and this part also tells us the name of the important person in the story. Uh, we start hearing about um, spices, xiang diao, or herbs, xiang cao. Balsam is uh, xiang zhi. Cinnamon, rou gui. Frankincense, rou xiang. Uh, custom. I had to look this one up. You can't find this online. I had to go to the authority on the history of the English language, the Oxford English Dictionary. And the Oxford English Dictionary tells us that this is another, this is the Latin name for what today we call costmary. Costmary in Chinese is ai zhu. Um, but that's not the the key word for this story right here. It says it also bears myrrh. Myrrh in Chinese is mo yao, mei de mei, mo yao. And too great a price was paid for that new creation. So this tells us that this myth is related to something terrible about fathers and daughters and leads to the creation of myrrh. A lot of myths are about the creation of plants or animals or some kind of tradition. Cupid himself denies that his darts ever harmed you, Mira. So the character's name is Mira. And swears that his torches likewise are guiltless. One of the three sisters bearing a venomous hydra and waving a Stygian firebrand must have inspired your passion. So the footnote tells us the three sisters are known as the Furies. The Furies, uh, okay. The Furies are a trio of ancient, ancient goddesses older than Zeus. And their, I guess, responsibility is to punish uh, unacceptable relations and actions inside the family, so between family members. The most famous example is uh, after Agamemnon came back from Troy, he was murdered by his wife Clytemnestra uh, because she was now with a new man named Agisthen, and so Agamemnon's son, Orestes, to avenge his father, killed his mother, Clytemnestra. But of course, sons are not supposed to kill their mothers. So as punishment, the Furies uh, tortured and chased him all around Greece. 
So they're responsible for uh, punishing improper family relations. Uh, so the poet here says, it must have been the Furies who did this to torture you. A Stygian firebrand. Stygian is the ad adjective for the river Styx. This is the river of Hades. This is the river of the underworld. Uh, so it has to do with punishment uh, and death. Hating a parent is wicked, but even more wicked than hatred is this kind of love. Uh, OK, so we kind of already get the idea of what this story is about. Uh, sexual desire of a daughter for her father. She understood and struggled against her perversion, asking herself, what have I begun? Where will it take me? So just to remind you, the question is, do you think she should bear or shoulder most of the blame for her incest, Lundwin? So here it says she, she knew it was wrong and she struggled against it. May heaven and piety, which means a faithful uh, behavior in religion, and the sacred rights of fathers restrain these unspeakable thoughts and repel my misfortune misfortune but look at the next line if indeed this is misfortune so the first three lines she's saying help me some god but then she turns around and says but maybe it's not so bad Yet piety chooses not to condemn this love outright or not directly. Without distinctions, animals copulate, so animals sleep with each other. Uh, it is no crime for the heifer or the female cow to bear the weight of her father upon her own back. Daughters are suitable wives in the kingdom of horses. So. She's now looking at the animal kingdom and thinking. It's not universally improper for fathers to sleep with their daughters. It's only improper for humans. Human morality gives us such stifling precepts. Precept here is jiao tiao. And makes indecent or improper what nature freely allows us. But people say there are nations where sons and their mothers, where fathers and daughters may marry each other, increasing the bonds of piety by their redoubled affections. So the redoubled affections, affections, uh, so the proper love between parent and child, and then also a second layer of romantic love or sexual desire. So it's redoubled. Wretched am I, Hankalian, who hadn't the luck to be born there, injured by nothing more than mischance of location. So she starts out saying, I know this is wrong, God help me. But then she says, oh, I wish I could. But then in the next stanza, she turns around again. Why do I obsess? Be gone, forbidden desires. Of course he is worthy of love, but love for a father. OK, but then she turns around again. So then if I were not the daughter of great Cinerus, I would be able to have intercourse with Cinerus. Uh, though he is mine, my father, he is not mine, my lover, and our nearness ruins me. I would be better off as a stranger. Uh, it would be good for me to go far away from my country as long as I could escape from my wicked desires. Uh, for what holds me here is the passion that I have to see him, to touch and speak to Cinerus and give him my kisses if nothing more is permitted. And this continues for a while. The idea is she knows it's wrong. 
but she can't help her sexual desire. This is uh, very different from the kind of literature that we often see today. Where something so uh, improper is not even considered. It's described, but only to condemn it, only to say unequivocally that it is wrong. In part, that is also uh, from the Christian tradition, because again, if humanity has eaten from the forbidden fruit, there's no in between. Either you ate or you did not eat. There is no like gray area in the middle. Um, but before such a clear cut morality, especially in the tradition of Greece and Rome, uh, different gods have different ideas and different uh, rules. So depending on which God you pray to or which God you follow, there might be different ideas of right and wrong. So there was much more of a gray area in that ancient culture. Um, so the story continues. She struggles against her desire. Uh, and finally, nor is she able to find any rest from her passion, save but in death. The word save here means but. The word but here means only. Or sorry, save means except for, but means only. So here it means the only way she could think of to get any rest from her desire is to die. I am on page 1056. Death pleases her and she gets up determined to hang herself from a beam, liang zhu, uh, da liang, I guess, zhu zi zi de, with her girdle, shu yao. Farewell, dear Sinirus. So she's not calling him father anymore, right? She's calling his name like, a, like he's another, just another man. May you understand why I do this, she said as she fitted the noose around her pale neck. A noose is just a rope or whatever you use to hang a person. They say that, so remember again, it's a poet telling us a myth. So they say that hearing her murmuring her faithful old nurse in the next chamber arose and entered her bedroom. Here a nurse is not someone who helps a doctor. The original meaning of nurse is naima, someone who helps to raise a child. At sight of the grim preparations, she screams out. Notice the change in tense, right? She arose, which is in the past, but now she screams out, which is in the present. This gives the change in to present tense gives this scene more immediacy. We more directly feel the emotion here. She screams out and striking her breasts and tearing her garments. Uh, this is the traditional behavior of somebody who is uh, in grief and despair and incredibly sad to beat your chest and to tear your clothing. And if you're even sadder, you can tear your hair. So she removes the noose from around the girl's neck and then only then she collapses and weeping embraces her, asking her why she would do it. Uh, of course, Mira can't bear to tell her nurse why. It's such a shameful desire. Uh, so the nurse keeps trying to get her to talk. Uh, Mira says, leave me, I beg you. So please go away. I'm now on page 1057. Um, and then Finally, the nurse gets Mira to admit what's wrong by saying, by threaten, uh, threatening now to disclose her attempted self-murder. 
disclose means to uh, reveal. But pledging to aid her if she confesses her passion. And so Mira can only bear to say this crucial line. Oh, mother, she cried, so fortunate you with your husband. And said no more, but groan, sunning. Uh, so therefore the nurse now understands what's going on, but because the nurse has already sworn to help. Uh, let's see. Speak and allow me to aid you. The, the nurse says this. Um, so she has promised to. To. Uh, right, I will be. Zealous, which means passionate in aiding your cause. Cause means uh, what you're trying to do. So the nurse has a, has promised to help her. Uh, so now the nurse has to help Mira somehow try to sleep with her father. Uh, so here the nurse says she will help Mira. Live then, the nurse replied, and possess your not daring to use the word father, she left her sentence unfinished, but called upon heaven to stand by her earlier promise. So now we have a second candidate for someone who should bear the responsibility for Mira's incest, the nurse. So how does she help Mira? Now it was time for the annual feast days of Ceres. Ceres is the goddess of the harvest uh, of. Uh, the the harvest in Chinese is so good. Uh, the pious and married women clad in white vestments, which means clothing. Pious means religious. Throng to the celebration to throng to something means to move as a crowd to gather as a crowd. Uh, the important part of this festival now for nine nights, the intimate touch of their men is considered forbidden. Among these matrons was Cancreus, wife of Cinerus for her attendance during these rites or religious rituals was required. So for these nine days, Cinerus cannot have sex with his wife. While the queen's place in his bed was left vacant, the overly diligent nurse came to Cinerus, finding him drunk and spoke to him of a maiden, which means a young woman whose passion for him was real, although her name wasn't and praising her beauty. When asked the age of this virgin, she said the same age as Mira. And then Cinerus commands the nurse to fetch her, to get her and bring her over here. So think about this. The nurse tells Cinerus, there is a beautiful young lady who wants to sleep with you. He asks her, how old is she? And the nurse says the same age as your daughter. Now. I don't know about you, but I think that any man who wants to sleep with a woman that's the same age as his daughter. Is very creepy and weird. So now we have a third candidate. Uh, to bear responsibility for the incest. Cinerus, Mira's father. Uh, so the nurse in at midnight in the dead of night, all black, all dark. Uh, brings Mira. To her father. And it there is no light. It's all, all dark at night because. Uh, the scene is fled by chaste Luna. Luna is the moon. The moon, as the footnote tells us, is connected with the goddess Diana uh, in Greek Artemis, who is a virgin goddess. 
So the moon, the virginal moon cannot bear to look at what's happening. And the stars under black clouds, the stars hide their scandalized faces. So no moon, no stars, it's pitch black. Uh, on the way thrice, three times, Mira stumbles and stops each time she hears the funereal owl. Uh, the sound of the owl was taken as a bad omen, Shongzhao. Uh, funereal means uh, having to do with dying and death. So she hears the owl three times, she stops three times, but she keeps going. Uh, she gets into Sinirus's bed, they have sex, uh, and he addresses her as it happened with a name befitting her years. He called her daughter while she called him father. So the right names were attached to their impious actions. Filled with the seed of her father, she left his bedchamber, having already conceived in a crime against nature, which she repeated the following night and thereafter. So she came back the next night and the next night and the next night. Until Cinerus, impatient to see his new lover after so many encounters, brought a light in and in the same moment, discovered his crime and his daughter. Grief, terrible sadness, left him speechless. He tore out his sword from the scabbard, Dao Chao. Mira sped off, she ran away, and thanks to night's shadowy darkness, escaped from her death. So, back to our question. Do you think Mira should shoulder most of the blame for her incest? Why or why not? Well, if you say yes, uh, it's because, of course, she is the person who falls in love with her father. She is the person who actively goes to have sex with him. Night after night, so yeah, she should be blamed, but should she have most of the blame? First of all, why did she fall in love with her father? The beginning of the story tells us. Cupid denies responsibility. He says he didn't do it. So the poet says it must have been the Furies. Who made her fall in love with her father? In other words, in the ancient Roman and Greek idea of passion. Emotions. These are seen as uncontrollable. Uh, or at, in, at their essence, basically they are things that are not to be controlled. You can control them, but being controlled is not part of what they are. You cannot direct your emotions. You can only guide your emotions. This is opposed to reason or rationality. You can guide your thoughts. You can direct your thoughts. Uh, you can uh, lead your thoughts, but you can only try to control your emotions. So falling in love with her father, not really her fault. But what about the act of incest? She tries her best to avoid it. She even tries to kill herself. She tries to keep her silence from her nurse, but the nurse uh, that threatens her and therefore forces her to tell the truth. Um, and then because the nurse has already sworn and promised to help her, uh, Mira doesn't have to do anything, anything at all. She just tells her nurse and her nurse takes care of everything else. So it seems like the nurse should bear more responsibility than Mira. But we have a third person, Cinerus, her father. The nurse tells him the young lady is the same age as your daughter. When Mira sleeps with him, they call each other father and daughter. 
So even though he doesn't know that it's his actual daughter, it does seem like the only thing that prevents him from willingly having sex with his daughter is the fact that she is his daughter, not her age, not her position in society, not the way that they meet, right? Because the, the way that they meet is very strange. Uh, the nurse tells Sinaris, there's a young lady who wants to have sex with you, and he says, yes. It's almost like uh, prostitution, almost like sex work, except for there's no money involved. Very strange. Um, but but of course, when we think about the nurse's responsibility, she couldn't have predicted that Mira's problem was that she had fallen in love with her father. So it's not strange for her to promise to help Mira with whatever problem she has if she doesn't suspect that the problem is improper. Right at that time, the nurse simply thinks that Mira has fallen in love with some man, maybe her own age, not her father. So like you can't really blame the nurse for trying to help the uh, young girl that she had been raising from when the girl was a baby. At this point, the nurse is like another uh, a second mother. And like. Yes, the father being willing to sleep with a woman, his daughter's age is very creepy, but as the conclusion shows, he's not willing to actually sleep with his daughter. So if we have to place blame on somebody, uh, maybe, I don't know, I would blame the father most, it, the nurse can't break her promise. It's considered offense against the gods to break a promise. So she had sworn to help Mir Mira, so the nurse had to help her. But the father could have decided he didn't want to sleep with a young lady the same age as his daughter. But really the point of this question is not to blame one person. The point is to show how uh, in the Greek and Roman way of thinking, uh, blame or responsibility is often not owed or placed onto individual people, but on the influence of some kind of God, whether it's the influence of Mira falling in love with her father or the influence of the nurse having to keep her promise because of the gods, or the fact that there was the opportunity for this incest to happen because of the feast of Ceres, a goddess. Uh, so today we would say it's an unlucky situation, uh, but we should also remember that behind this situation is uh, various ideas of being pious and faithful to various different gods and goddesses. OK, do you have questions about uh, number two? OK, let's move on to question three. Um, so continuing, Mira escapes. Uh, she's about to give birth. Remember, she had conceived after nine months. She's about to give birth. Uh, so she's tired of living, but frightened of dying. She's scared of dying because she has committed this unholy act. And so if she dies, she would go to hell or like to go suffer uh, in the underworld. So she doesn't want to live, she doesn't want to die. Instead, she prays to the gods. Oh gods, if there should be any who hear my confession, I do not turn away from the terrible sentence that my misbehavior deserves. Sentence here is liang xing. Uh, 
But lest I should outrage the living by my survival. Uh, lest means so that I don't. Or in case. Uh, in case lest I should outrage the living by my survival or the dead by my dying. Drive me from both of these kingdoms. Transform me wholly so that both life and death are denied me. This is why these poems are called the metamorphoses, because people and things transform. They metamorphose. Some God did hear her confession, and heaven answered her final prayer, for even as she was still speaking, the earth rose up over her legs. I'm on page 1059. And from her toes burst roots that spread widely to hold the tall trunk chigan, in position. Shugan. Her bones put forth wood, and even though they were still hollow, zongkong, they now ran with sap shuzi, and not blood. Her arms became branches, and those were now twigs that used to be called her fingers. Twigs are small branches. While her skin turned to hard bark, shupi. The tree kept on growing over her swollen belly, wrapping it tightly, growing over her breast and up to her neck. She could bear no further delay, and as the wood rose, plunged her face down into the bark and was swallowed. Loss of her body has meant the loss of her feeling, and yet she weeps and the warm drops spill from her tree trunk. So this is uh, the origin of the myrrh tree, which produces the tree sap called myrrh. But under the bark, the infant conceived in such baseness, which means uh, a low and improper birth. Continued to grow and now sought a way out of Mira. Uh, and with the help of Lucina, the goddess of childbirth. Uh, was birthed a ball or was born a bawling boy child. Whom Nyads, a Nyad is a kind of nymph or Shenu placed in soft grasses and bathed in the tears of its mother. Not even envy could have found fault with his beauty. So envy as a goddess could have found fault with his beauty. For he resembled one of the so it's basically he's a beautiful young baby boy. Uh, and his name is Adonis. I remember somewhere his name. OK, so we don't get the moment where he is given his name, but his name is Adonis, and that leads us into the next story. Venus and Adonis. Uh, the question is, she's pricked by Cupid's arrow. Uh, OK, time swiftly glides by in secret, escaping our notice. Uh, a so a most beautiful infant now is an adolescent, Qing Sonian, and now a young man. So time flies very quickly. Infant, adolescent, young man. Even more beautiful than he was as a boy. Pleasing now even to Venus. And soon the avenger of passionate fires that brought his mother to ruin. So the the young man is going to avenge. Uh, his mother, so his mother was brought to ruin by Venus or or somebody in charge of her love for her father. So now this young man will bring trouble to Venus as revenge. For while her fond Cupid, her is Venus. Uh, Cupid is her son. 
her fond Venus was giving a kiss to his mother, he pricked her unwittingly, accidentally, right in the breast with an arrow projecting out of his quiver. A quiver is where you keep the arrows. I don't know the Chinese name for this. Annoyed, the great goddess swatted him off, Parapaizo, but the wound had gone in more deeply than it appeared to, and at the beginning deceived her. So the the prick from the arrow does have an effect on Venus. Under the spell of this fellow's beauty, this fellow is Adonis, the young man. Uh, the goddess now, next page 1060, now prefers Adonis and clings to him, his constant companion. So because of Cupid's arrow, she has fallen in love with this uh, young human, beautiful young human man. Let's take a 10 minute break. So Venus is now spending all her days with Adonis. The question was, how does the idea that Venus is also vulnerable to Cupid's arrows change our understanding of what the gods mean to the ancient Greeks and Romans? So if the gods represent different ideas, moments, and skills in human life, so they are the embodiment of some abstract ideas um, or events or skills. Um, and yet these abstract ideas could be changed or influenced by the beginning of love. So this seems to say that uh, in, in general terms, not necessarily for Venus, but for all the gods, it seems to say that love can have an effect on every aspect of life, whether it's about intelligence or practical wisdom or seizing the right moment or skills like carpentry, woodworking, or like sewing or sailing. Love, it seems to say, can affect and influence all of these. But what about this specific case where Venus, goddess of beauty and love, is also affected by the beginning of love due to Cupid? Well, if Venus is the goddess of love and beauty, or that means that she is the embodiment of the idea of love and the idea of beauty. So this seems to be saying that the beginning of love can change our understanding of what is beauty and what is love. To put this in plain English, when we fall in love, it might not be with the kind of person we think we might fall, fall in love with. So it changes our idea of love. It might not be with a person who looks like uh, someone like who doesn't look like what we say we want to see in our lover. So it might be we may fall in love with someone that we don't necessarily think is beautiful or handsome. Uh, and yet the longer we love them, the more beautiful or handsome they may look. So love also changes our idea of beauty as well. The beginning and experience of love can change our idea of love and our idea of beauty. That At least that's what I think uh, this part of the myth is saying. But of course, Adonis himself is incredibly handsome. Uh, so the change for Venus is not necessarily in the definition of beauty, but in the idea of love. What kind of person Venus thought she would be able to love or end up loving? 
as a goddess, she probably didn't think she would love a human, but uh, due to Cupid, here she is in love with a human named Adonis. OK, do you have questions about number three? OK, number four. Uh, Adonis asks a question. So let's look at this. So Venus spends all day with Adonis uh, and. Adonis likes to hike through the mountains and through the forests. Right, roaming with him through woods and up mountains. Uh, I'm on page 1060. So Venus follows him, but she avoids the fierce wild boars, Yeju, and rapacious wolves and bears armed with sharp claws, and shuns the lions. Lion here is not like an African lion. A lion here is a mountain lion. Oh. Uh, and she warns you also to fear the wild beasts, Adonis. If only her warning were heeded, if only you had followed her warnings. Uh, so Adonis asks, why? Why should I avoid the wild beasts and be afraid of like lions and uh, mountain lions and wolves and uh, bears? And when he asked why, Venus said, I will tell you this story, which will amaze you with its retribution, which means uh, like punishment, delivered for ancient wrongdoing. Uh, so she begins telling a story to Adonis. And this is the story of Atalanta. So the question is, does this story answer Adonis's question. Why should he avoid the, the wild animals? So OK, so no, now notice there are two sets of quotation marks because it is the poet telling us these myths. And within this myth, it is Venus telling Adonis this particular story. Uh, perhaps you'll heard of a maiden able to vanquish, which means defeat, the swift, the swiftest of men in a foot race. Uh, nor could you say, nor could you say whether she deserved praise more for her speed or her beauty. So this woman is both very fast and very beautiful. She asked some God about husbands. A husband, the God answered, is not for you, Atalanta. Flee from a husband. But you will not flee, and losing yourself will live on. So that doesn't sound very nice. Uh, so because of this, she hides in the forest. But because she's so beautiful, many men want to marry her, right? She has many suitors. And so she says, you cannot have me unless you outrun me. Come race against me. A bride and a bed for the winner. Death to the losers. Those are the rules of the contest. Wow. So to marry her, you have to race her, but if you lose, you die. Venus also thinks this is very uh, extravagant. Cruel? Indeed. But such was this young maiden's beauty, page 1061, that a foolhardy throng of admirers took up the wager. So not just one man, but many men wanted to race her. <laughs> As a spectator, Hippomenes, another man, sat in the grandstand, so sat with the audience, asking why anyone ever would risk such a danger. However, 
as soon as he caught a glimpse of her beauty, uh, her face and her body both bared for the contest. So Atalanta is racing naked, probably because it makes her faster. He threw up both hands and cried out, I beg your pardons who only a moment ago disparaged your efforts, but truly I had no idea of the trophy you strive for. So now that he sees how beautiful Atalanta, Atalanta is, he also understands why uh, men would risk dying for her. So as you I'm sure can tell, he also decides to race her. Uh, here we have a description of, of what it looks like when she's running and basically she's very beautiful. Uh, she crossed the finish line while Hippomenes was still looking at her and Atalanta victorious was given a crown and the glory. The groaning losers were taken off. End of their story. Haha, <laughs> they died. Uh, and then Hippomenes. Notice this right after the other men are dragged off to die right after. Hippomenes stood on the racetrack and fixed his gaze on the maiden and said, why seek such an easy victory over these sluggards? A sluggard is a slow person. Contend with me. Right after the other men died, he wants to race her. <laughs> and if fortune makes me the winner, you will at least have been beaten by one not unworthy. I am the son of Megarius and son of Neptune. My great grandfather. OK, so this Hippomenes isn't just some random dude. He's the grandson of Neptune. Neptune is the Roman name for Poseidon, god of the sea. So Hippomenes isn't just some guy. His grandfather is not just a god, but one of the oldest, one of the older gods, Poseidon and Zeus and Hades are brothers. Uh, as he spoke, Atalanta's countenance softened. Countenance means her facial expression. Uh, she wondered whether she wished to win or to be one. And asked herself which God jealous of her suitors beauty sought to destroy him by forcing him into this marriage. So it turns out Hippomenes is also very handsome and beautiful. So when Atalanta looks at him, she didn't know whether she wanted to win the race or to be one like as the prize for losing the race. So like if Hippomenes wins the race, the prize is Atalanta. He would win her as the prize. So to be one. Uh, and she says, nor am I moved by his beauty, though I could be, but I am moved by his youth. His boyishness stirs me. And what of his valor, which means courage? His mind so utterly fearless. What of his watery origins, his relation to Neptune? What of the fact that he loves me and wishes to wed me and is willing to die if bitter fortune denies him? Uh, and she tries to discourage him from raising her because she doesn't want him to die. Uh, but then she turns around and says, why should I care for you after so many have already perished? Perish means to die. Now he will learn. Let him die then, since the great slaughter of suitors has taught him nothing. He must be wary of living. I think it's hot high later. I'm on page 1062. Uh, so they they race. But before they race. 
Hippomenes prays to Venus. He anxiously begged me. Me is Venus, right? Venus is telling the story. Cytherean Venus, I pray you preside at my venture. So, so to stand over my attempt. Aiding the fires that you yourself have ignited. Since you have made me fall in love with her, you should help me to win her. And so Venus does help him. She goes to a field somewhere in Cyprus. Cyprus, uh, Cyprus is an island in uh, in the Mediterranean Sea near Greece. Uh, so here on this island in this field is a tree. She owns a tree. Venus owns a tree uh, that is made of gold. So she had just gotten back from a visit to this place and she has three golden apples. And she gives them to Hippomenes to use. Uh, they start the race. They are so fast that it looks like they're flying, their feet barely brushing the surface. But of course, Atalanta is still faster. When she could have very easily passed him, she lingered beside him, her gaze full of desperate longing. So not only is Atalanta faster than him, she's also so much faster that running next to him, she can still look at him with desire. She's not even trying very hard to race. Uh, but in the end, she still reluctantly sped ahead. Uh, and now you might be thinking, if she loves him, why doesn't she just lose the race on purpose? And this is because in ancient Greece and Rome, sportsmanship, Rindongjajingsen, was very important. If you were uh, competing in a competition, it is very important that you try your best. It's a sign of respect for the other competitors and a sign of respect for the gods because the gods blessed every competition. So if you don't try your best, uh, you are offending the gods. However, sportsmanship does not expand to include not cheating. You should try your best, but you don't always have to play fair. And we're going to see how Hippomenes uses these golden apples. And now Hippomenes, dry mouthed, was breathlessly gasping. The finish line far in the distance. He threw out an apple, and the sight of that radiant fruit astounded the maiden who turned from her course and retrieved the glittering missile. Hippomenes passed her. So how does he use the apples? He throws them so that Atalanta will want to chase them. And therefore he can gain a little advantage in the race. Surely this is cheating. Uh, but in the tradition of ancient Greece and Rome, this kind of cheating is fine. Uh, as long as your cheating doesn't hurt anyone, doesn't kill anyone, uh, and as long as like you're not um, like working with a group of people in a conspiracy, Ingmo, but like individual cheating is fine. Another famous instance. Uh, is at the end of the Iliad. If you remember, um, after um, Achilles kills Hector, he drags Hector's corpse around the Greek camp every morning. The next thing that happens, which we didn't read, is that he puts on the funeral games for his best friend Patroclus. Uh, so in ancient Greece, one way to celebrate uh, the death of a famous person, I guess not celebrate, commemorate, is to hold competitions, to hold sports, 
in their memory. Uh, and in the funeral games, one of the games is a chariot race. Uh, 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 and one of the in one of the races, uh, I forget who, but one of the Greek heroes cheats by using his chariot to like squeeze against the other chariot. And so to prevent an accident, the other person has to slow down. And so the first person wins the race. So individual cheating is OK. Uh, of course, we don't live in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, so please don't cheat on your final exam. So that's what he does. Every time Atalanta passes him, he throws a golden apple uh, and she goes to retrieve the apple. Uh, and then at the end, he throws the third apple, the furthest. Uh, so far that Atalanta was thinking whether she it was worth going to 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 grab the apple, but I, Venus, forced her to get it and add on its weight to the burden she carried. Right, because like she has to carry these golden apples. And she's not wearing any clothes. She has to hold them in her arms and hands. Time lost and weight gained were equal obstructions. And Atalanta loses the race. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, she says, Venus says to Adonis, wasn't I worthy of being thanked for my troubles? Offered a gift of sweet incense? Heedless of all I had done, he offered me neither. So Hippomenes was helped by the goddess and yet did not thank her, did not repay her. Uh, and so in revenge, Venus uh, leads Hippomenes and Atalanta to a place deep in the forest. And this place is a shrine to the ancient goddess Sibylle. Uh, this goddess is not a Greek goddess. I think it's a Roman goddess. Uh, and here at this shrine to a goddess, Venus gives Hippomenes sexual desire. Uh, right, it says unbridled desire, which means uncontrollable desire, possessed Hippomenes moved by the strength of my godhead. So I use my goddess powers to give him sexual desire. And so at this shrine to the ancient religion, Hippomenes entered that place and by his forbidden behavior defiled it uh, because it was impious. It was not allowed to have sex in a holy place, as I'm sure you understand. Uh, and so to punish them, Sibylle, the owner of this shrine, the goddess, turned them into lions uh, and took them to pull her chariot. Uh, so Sibylle's chariot is not uh, Mata, it's Baoche. And that's the end of her story. Venus says to Adonis, my darling, you must avoid these and all other wild beasts. Who will not turn tail, so when they see you, they won't turn around. Instead, they will show off their boldness in battle. They will fight you. And that's the end of her story. So. Back to our question, question four. Do you think the story of Atalanta answers Adonis's question? Why should you avoid or why should he avoid these wild animals? Um, I, I, I don't think there is a direct connection between the story of Atalanta and the ending, which is you must avoid these and all other wild beasts. If there's any connection, it's the idea that these wild beasts are unholy or may be unholy. Maybe they are wild beasts because they have offended the gods somehow. 
So like by engaging with them, by interacting with them, you would be interacting with someone unholy. But then Venus says they won't hide, they won't run, but they will fight you in battle. So it, it se seems like she's talking about the danger of wild animals. And yet, like when at the end of the story of Atalanta, they don't kill these two lovers, right? Hippomenes and Atalanta, who are turned, her, who are turned into mountain lions. They aren't. They don't kill anyone. All they do is they get turned. They they help to pull the goddess's chariot. They are forced to pull her chariot. So there doesn't seem to be a connection between the story and the reason supposedly that Venus is telling the story. Uh, and so like this point really shows us how like these framing stories, the the outside stories supposedly giving us the reason for the myths are not the point, right? The point is the myths themselves. Why do people tell the myths? Not as important. Uh, so like the the poet saw, maybe I guess the poet saw a connection between uh, Adonis and wild animals and the wild animals that Atalanta is turned into. And so like he maybe he was like, oh, there's a connection here. I guess I could put these two stories together. But really, like the the moral or the reason of these stories doesn't really connect. Um, okay, do you have questions about number four? Okay, question five. Compare the. Ooh, okay. Is is that a question? Did somebody turn on their microphone? No, OK. Compare the story of Pygmalion with the story of Venus and Adonis. How are they similar? How are they different? Well, we actually have not yet finished the story of Adonis. It keeps going. We finished the story of Atalanta, and now we come back to Venus and Adonis. After warning him, Venus went off on her journey. Uh, but Adonis's courage resisted her admonitions. Admonition just means warning. Uh, so what happens is he's hunting a boar, Uh and they 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 like corner the boar, and Adonis. Here uh, throws his spear to kill it, but the spear hits the boar at an angle, so not directly, and therefore the spear does not kill the boar. With its long snout, beads it, it turned and knocked loose the weapon, stained with its own blood, then bore down upon our hero. It sank its tusks, uh, ya, tsang ya. Um, like not teeth, right? Uh, I don't really know the Chinese for this. Uh, but it sank its tusks deep into the young fellow's privates. So Adonis's private parts, Shu Shibu, are injured by the boar. Uh, and next page, 1064, he lay there dying. Venus hears his uh, painful cries, comes back to his side, and argues with fate. This is something we saw Zeus try to do in the Iliad, but the other gods won't let him. Here, there are no other gods nearby, so Venus argues with fate. It will not be altogether as you would have it, she said. Altogether means completely. Have it means to make it like something. So here she's saying it won't be like you want it to be. Uh, why? As she spoke, she sprinkled his blood with sweet nectar. 
Kwame. Uh, and in no more than an hour, a flower sprang out of that soil, blood red in its color, just like the flesh that lies underneath the tough rind of the seed hiding pomegranate. So this flower is red like the seed of a pomegranate, 石榴. And its name, anemone. So this is the story of the creation of the anemone flower. Now, anemone uh, more commonly is a sea animal in Chinese haikui. But as a flower, its Chinese name is yinglianhua. Uh, and it's known for uh, the, the petals are blown away easily. So that and then that's the ending of the story of Venus and Adonis. So let's come back to question five. Comparing the story of Pygmalion with Venus and Adonis. What happened in Pygmalion? The dude makes a statue. He falls in love with the statue. He prays to Venus. Venus turns the statue into a woman. And the woman gives birth to uh, a daughter. End of that story. What happens in Venus and Adonis? Uh, Adonis is the son of. I guess he's like the great grandson. I, I have to count. Let's see. Pygmalion, Paphon, Cynera, Mira, Adonis. That's five generations. So. Uh, so, uh, father, grandfather, great father, great great grandfather. Adonis is the great great grandson of Pygmalion. So beautiful that Venus falls in love with him. Uh, she tells a story to warn him away from the danger of wild animals. He doesn't listen. He gets killed by a wild boar. She turns him into a flower. So uh, we see some similarities, right? Both stories have Venus. Both stories involve the transformation from object to human or from human to object. And both stories involve great beauty. And we can even say that the reason for the transformations are because of the great beauty. Pygmalion's statue is so beautiful that he wants her transformed into a woman. Adonis is so handsome that when he dies, Venus transforms him into a flower. Mm, but how are they dissimilar? Well, their main dissimilarities are that Pygmalion does everything right, and so Venus rewards him, whereas Adonis does everything wrong and Venus saves him. Uh, and also another difference is that Pygmalion and his statue begin a new family line, right? Five generations. But Adonis does not have children, so he is the end of his family line. Uh, so in fact, today, not only are we have we read uh, a series of interconnected myths, but the, this interconnected series of myths is also the story of a family complete, right? Pygmalion and his statue wife and their children, or I guess child, Paphos, the daughter, her child, Cinerus, the the king, his child, Mira, his daughter, and then they produce a child, Adonis, and then Adonis dies. So it's also the story of a family. Ovid's Metamorphoses is organized like this, cycles of stories. Uh, so not just one story after another, but there are connections between the stories. And when there is no connection between two stories, it is connected by the narrator. So remember today, all of 
what we were reading today is told by the musician Orpheus. So at the end of this cycle, uh, after he finishes this cycle, maybe someone will tell Orpheus, wow, that's so sad. Do you have other stories? And Orpheus will go on to tell a new story and a new cycle, something like this. Uh, so it's cycles of stories within cycles of stories. And by this organization, individual myths about a flower or like about uh, a statue or about some kind of tradition are connected and and uh, woven together into that field of inquiry that we call ancient Greek and Roman myths. So it's not like today when you watch something like a movie like Percy Jackson, right? Uh, all of the gods exist together in one world and they're all in heaven and there's only two places, right? The Earth and and Olympus. The, the, the mountain of the gods. It's really like each god is worshipped in a specific way in each different place and people believe that the gods interact with each other, but they, they don't really belong in, in one same world. Uh, and so the myths are similar, right? Why do we have this flower? Why do we have this tradition? Oh, because of this story. Uh, but when you really dig deep into these myths, there is no real connection between the world of each myth. The connection is created by Ovid when he organizes these myths according to uh, the interaction between narrators. Another way to say this is that in the Metamorphoses, uh, at least in this part, the musician Orpheus is playing the same role as Homer plays for the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, just like Homer, Orpheus didn't write these myths. He didn't create these myths. He's simply organizing them and then passing them down, telling them to others. So in the same way, we have different versions of the Iliad and different versions of the Odyssey and Homer organized them and put them together and passed them down to us as a single story. OK, so do you have questions about number five? Somebody said earthquake. Uh, I happen to live somewhere where I can't feel earthquakes very easily. Uh, so, these are Um Really? Okay. Uh, I hope you guys are safe that nobody fell down or something. Uh, OK, uh, let's come back to the class. Do you have questions about number five? <laughs> OK, uh, if not, let's go back to the uh, beginning of this week's reading and we'll talk about them in more detail. OK, so the beginning, book 10, the footnote tells us that this is the book that is told by the musician Orpheus. Um, and at the beginning of this story is a connection to the previous story. The previous story is about a group of women who were punished and became history's first prostitutes or sex workers. Pygmalion observed how these women lived lives of sordid indecency. Sordid means unclean. And Dismayed by the numerous defects of character nature had given the feminine spirit, 
stayed as a bachelor, having no female companion. So because Pygmalion heard the story of these terrible women, he decided he did not want to marry anyone. Uh, but during that time, he created an ivory statue. We talked about this part. Uh, so let's skip to. Uh, here. Top of page 1054. The holiday honoring Venus has come and all Cyprus turns out to celebrate. Again, Cyprus is an island that is important for Venus. They worship her there. To turn out means to come out. Hyphers, uh, female cows, with gilded horns. Gilded is Shangjing or Tangjing. Uh, buckle under the death blow. To buckle means to collapse. A death blow because they are being sacrificed. Um, and incense, xiang qi, xiang yan. Uh, there should be a better Chinese for this, but like scented smoke. Soars up in thick clouds. Uh, the Greeks and Romans believed that uh, the gods survived on incense and ambrosia. Ambrosia is heavenly nectar, tian mi. Uh, by the way, tusk uh, in Chinese is liao ya, the tusk of the wild boar that killed Ad uh, Adonis. So uh, because the gods survive on incense, uh, Xing Xiang, Xiang Lu, something like that. Um, so at every holy festival, people would burn incense for the gods. Uh, and having already brought his own gift to the altar, Ji Bai Tai, Ji Si Tai, Ji Si Tai, then Pygmalion offered this faint-hearted prayer, a faint-hearted, which means he doesn't really believe that it's going to come true, but he prays anyway. And how, what does he pray for? If you in heaven are able to give us whatever we ask for, then I would like as my wife, and not daring to say my ivory maiden, said one like my statue. Since Golden Venus was present there at her altar, she knew what he wanted to ask for, and as a good omen, uh, three times the flames soared and leapt right up to the heavens. So the fire burst up three times, and this is a good sign. Once home, Pygmalion went straight to the replica of his sweetheart. Replica means like a reproduction created in the same image. So it's not technically the right word here because it, the statue is not a replica of his sweetheart. The statue is his sweetheart. There is no reproduction. Threw himself down on the couch. OK, the word couch does not mean sofa. Sava is not what it means. Uh, a couch is any furniture that is long and not a bed. So a sofa is a kind of couch, right? The sofa has like three or four seats. There are cushions, there's an armrest, but not every couch is a sofa. In ancient Rome, instead of chairs, most wealthy Romans uh, used couches and they would lie down instead of sitting. Uh, if you're interested, you can go Google an image or Roman couch. So anyways, he put her, he put the statue on the couch. 
when he comes home, he goes to the statue and repeatedly kissed her. She seemed to grow warm. And so he repeated the action, kissing her lips and exciting her breasts with both hands. Aroused, the ivory softened and losing its stiffness yielded. Yield originally means rangbu, but here it means it gives way. It gives space. So like when you press it, it moves away. Bian rou ran, you could say. Submitting to his caress, fu mo, as wax, la, softens when it is warmed by the sun and handled by fingers, takes on many forms and by being used becomes useful. So this ivory turns into something like wax and it softens. Amazed, he rejoices, then doubts. Obviously, right? Because like who would really believe that their statue really turned into a human? Impossible. So first he's happy and then he, he's, he has doubts, then fears he's mistaken while again and again he touches on what he has prayed for. She is alive, and her veins leap under his fingers. A vein is a blood vessel, xie mai. So the idea is that he can feel her blood vessel uh, with his fingers. You can believe that Pygmalion offered the goddess his thanks in a torrent of speech. A torrent is a big, great flow of water. So it's comparing his talking to a big flow of water. Everything is pouring out of him. See, this is the proper response. When a god helps you, you should thank the god. Once again, kissing those lips that were not untrue that she felt his kisses and timidly blushing. Uh, she opened her eyes to the sunlight and at the same time first looked on her lover and heaven. So this is nice. She opens her eyes to the sunlight, so that's heaven. And she also sees her lover. And so putting her lover and heaven together like this makes it seem like her lover is heaven. The goddess attended the wedding since she had arranged it, uh, and then they gave birth to Paphos, as we talked about earlier. So this is a classic myth that uh, has many different versions throughout Western literary history. The most recent version of this myth is the story of Frankenstein. Right, a mad scientist named Victor Frankenstein uh, steals body parts from a cemetery, puts them together, adds electricity, and he creates life. The put together body parts come alive and becomes Frankenstein's monster. Uh, same thing, right? Dead things turning into a living human whether it's body parts or a statue. Uh, so, you know, this story, the idea of a dead thing turning into a human thing is still very much a part of the Western literary tradition. And if you mention the name Pygmalion uh, to people who have some idea of literature, they will know exactly what you're talking about. Today, when most people talk about Pygmalion, it's a negative idea. It's the idea that a man will try to change a woman into the kind of woman that he likes. Uh, this is unhealthy behavior. It's healthier to find a woman that you that you can love rather than to choose any woman and try to turn her into a woman that you can love. Uh, like today we would say like he's he's like Pygmalion treating his wife like a statue or something. So it's a negative comparison. 
Uh, OK, let's stop here. Do you have questions? OK, so that concludes our unit on myths and legends. Before next week, um, please go read the first unit of Oedipus Tyrannos. It's about 15 to 20 pages. I finally tracked down the new version, so it should be easier to read. And we'll talk about that next week. <laughs>